He is a PhD student in the social uh, of Earth School of Earth so, uh, School of Earth Sciences at the University of Melbourne. He is primarily a self-taught programmer who discovered software carpentry a few years ago while working at the Centre for Australian Weather and Climate Research. Uh, he's here to tell us all about how software carpentry has arrived in Australia. So please welcome Damien Irving. Thanks, guys. Um, well, as mentioned, uh, this afternoon I'll be talking about Software Carpentry, which is a, a volunteer-based organisation that teaches basic computing skills to scientists. And so basically I'll start by making the case for why we need an organisation like Software Carpentry, and then I'll have a, a bit of a look at what we teach to scientists and how we teach it, uh, and in particular reference to a, a, a workshop we held in Melbourne uh, earlier this year that I was involved in organising. And then I'll finish it looking at um, how you guys might uh, be able to get involved in software carpentry yourself. So I guess the major reason why we need software carpentry is because graduate scientists, so that is scientists, undergraduates who have just, say, completed their Bachelor of Science or something like that, uh, aren't computationally competent. Um, and I guess my own experience is a perfect example of this. So I graduated. Uh, well, actually, I should give you, tell you what I'm doing right now. So I am a PhD, as was, as was mentioned, at the University of Melbourne. Uh, I'm looking at climate variability in West Antarctica, so I'm a, a meteorologist by training. Um, but back when I did graduate from my undergraduate uh, honours degree in 2009, uh, fortunately, this comic wasn't true. Uh, I was able to find work. This is, uh, you might not be able to read that uh, text anyway. But basically, when I, when I graduated, I had very little... I guess, idea of just basic software programming principles. So I'd done, I think in first year, I did like a, an intro to scientific programming course, so I knew what a for loop was and stuff like that. Um, I did uh, a winter school in the engineering faculty, I think, like it was an introduction to, to Fortran. And neither of those courses were prerequisites of my degree, so I was actually well ahead of my peers having done any programming whatsoever in my undergraduate years. Uh, and then I did my honours year, so you spend a year doing a research project, but as you can imagine, you've, by the time you get the coursework out of the way, you've got about six months in an honours year to do an entire thesis, write the thing up and submit. So you're not really learning how to write good code, you're just quickly hacking other people's codes and make it do the things you want it to do to quickly get that thesis uh, done. So I basically walk out the door with my Bachelor of Science honours degree with no idea about issue tracking or version control or writing maintainable programs in a systematic way. I basically completely ignorant of any of the, the tools and techniques that are just standard practice in the software industry. And so I, I walk into my new job at CSIRO as a climate projection scientist, and I get given the keys to uh, one of the supercomputers at the National Computing Infrastructure in Canberra. I've got multiple terabytes of climate model data to look at. You know, my boss says, go. Um, and not surprisingly, <laughs> in those first months, uh, at CSIRO, I'm incredibly inefficient. You know, it's taking me weeks to do things that should take minutes. I'm reinventing wheels. I'm struggling to collaborate with people. And all the while, I'm contributing to a fairly high-profile project that has really tight deadlines in a field of science that is, that is highly politicised and any mistakes that are made are really seized upon by sceptics in the community. So this obviously isn't an ideal situation, but uh, I'm certainly not the only one that happens too. In, in all fields of science, whether it be like astronomy, ecology, medical science, you name it, graduates are coming out, they really have no idea of even the basics of programming, and then they've just got these mountains of data to analyse. So that's why we need software carpentry. And I guess the obvious question is, well, why aren't these scientists computationally competent when they graduate? There's probably three major reasons. The first is that there's just no room in the curriculum. So most university lecturers, if you talk to them, they would agree that it would be nice to teach some programming in undergraduate degrees, but they just can't find the room. There isn't, I mean, what do you take out of the meteorology degree? Do you take out, you know, theories of thunderstorm development or the greenhouse effect? Or these are all like really fundamental things that meteorologists need to know. So it's just impossible to find room. Uh, the second is that there's no kind of standards. I mean, granting agencies and scientific journals and stuff, they don't really expect the same standards of computational work as they do for other experimental work. So there's no uh, big stick telling scientists uh, to lift their game when it comes to programming. And it's also a little bit of a case of the blind leading the blind. So computing has come a very long way 
in a very short space of time. So senior lecturers at university probably don't know the things that need to be taught to the undergraduates. So that, that doesn't help either. OK, so they're not computationally composite. Why is it a massive problem? There's probably two main major reasons. The first relates to efficiency, uh, a little bit like my, my struggles when I first arrived at CSIRO. And if, if you think about a problem and I guess the solving power you have to solve that problem, there's probably three corners on the triangle. So um, your solving power depends firstly on, I guess, machine speed and algorithm speed. But both those things have sped up astronomically in the last you know, decade or so. So you know, a, a simulation that took a year to run you know, 10 or 15 years ago, you can probably run in a minute these days. So you've had like, you know, orders of magnitude increase in both those factors. But in terms of development time, the time it takes to actually write the code, there is some work out there that shows that that has improved with scientists a little bit, but we're talking small percentage increases, not orders of magnitude. And so the bottom line really is that for scientists today, getting their code to do the right thing is actually a bigger bottleneck than its running time. So that's one reason why computational competency is so important. Uh, the other reason relates to transparency. So many of you might be aware that there's been a strong push in science in recent years to make science more open and transparent. And one of, the, one of the topics that comes up when you're talking about these things is the reproducibility of published science. So if you go to a scientific journal and you read a, a paper in that journal, the theory basically says that someone working in the field should be able to take your paper and just going on the information that they've provided in that paper, they should be able to reproduce your results. All right? And uh, that's not always the case. And so Nature, which is probably the most famous journal in the sciences, published a whole heap of, a whole series of articles in 2012 on the irreproducibility of uh, the science that they publish. Um, and it, it culminated in uh, some quite major changes to the checklist that uh, research, so if, if you're given a uh, if you're a researcher and you get sent a paper from Nature to review, you have to go through this checklist. And one of the items on the checklist now says, did the author submit their code, their source code, uh, to you as the reviewer, or did they upload it to some kind of public repository uh, so it can be viewed? And so that's a that's a major change. And you can certainly imagine that in 10 or 20 years' time, that'll trickle down, and basically all scientific journals that have anything to do with computing will be uh, basically demanding that authors provide their source code. And in fact, we've already seen uh, websites like Run My Code pop up recently, where basically scientists can provide their code up on the site like that, and actually people can log into the site and actually execute that code on the author's data in the cloud, or um, people can even upload their own data and execute the author's code on their own data. So that's a, that's a really cool thing. And so basically, the graduates of today, when they're doing the bulk of their research and the bulk of their writing papers in 10 or 20 years from now, it's almost a sure thing that they're going to have to be submitting their code like this and making it publicly available, which is terrifying for most scientists today. Um, and that's the other reason why this um, computational competency is so important. OK, so hopefully I've convinced you that uh, software carpentry, uh, or sorry, that uh, computational competency is, is a problem for scientists. And the question is, well, how do we fix that? I mean, what should we be teaching scientists, when should we be teaching it to them, and how should we be teaching it to them? Um, and fortunately, Software Carpentry has been working on the answer to this question since the late 90s. And we've heard a few references to Greg Wilson today. So he was the, the founder of Software Carpentry. He's a, uh, a Canadian um, programmer. And basically, back in 1995, 96, he wrote a series of papers titled, uh, What Should computer scientists teach to physical scientists and engineers. And the papers were really born out of his frustration working with physicists who wanted to do pretty complex things with computers but really didn't have uh, even an idea of the basics. And in response to his papers, he got invited by the director of the Advanced Computing Laboratory at the Los Alamos National Laboratory in the US uh, to run some courses for the physicists at that lab. Um, and so over a four-year four period, he ran nine uh, one-week courses, and then he got a job elsewhere and, and moved off, and, and that was that. But I think that the major learning point from what I'd call iteration one of software carpentry was that a week was too long. These, a lot of the scientists just didn't have a full week to commit. Um, they were fried by the end of the week because there was just so much new information uh, on top of them. So that was probably the learning point there. 
The second iteration of software carpentry happened in 2004-05 where Greg and some others actually got uh, a grant from the, Poth, the, the Python Software Foundation to put uh, all their teaching materials up online uh, to make them freely available. Uh, probably a little bit like uh, universities these days have their open courseware where you can go and basically view all the teaching materials uh, for free. Um, I think they were hoping that then there'd be a bit of an explosion in the teaching of uh, basic programming to undergraduates because it'd be easy to teach, all the materials are freely available, teachers would be providing new material and it'd be constantly updated, but it never really took off. And I think that's where the, those core group of people that started Software Carpentry started to realise that at least in the foreseeable future, uh, there's not going to be that um, full-scale teaching of programming to scientists um, at an undergraduate level just because this, there isn't room in the curriculum. And then so the, the third iteration happened in 2010. They managed to cobble together about oh, uh, funding from about 12 different organisations and they recorded 120 short video lessons that they put up online uh, and ran three online classes. So a little bit like if anyone's heard of MOOCs these days, the, the massive open online courses that universities are running, it was kind of like one of them. Um, but the major problem was Today's MOOCs get hundreds of thousands of um, people registering for their courses. So when completion rates are as low as about 5% of these courses, it doesn't matter so much because 5% of 100,000 is still a very big number. But obviously these courses didn't have quite as big a profile as that. And so when you only have hundreds of applicants, 5% of that is not many people. So kind of the, the learning point there was they needed an in-person model. This, this online model wasn't really capturing people. They needed to be teaching it in person. But the model needed to be scalable so that lots of different people could be teaching just because it was, it's obviously too much work and you're not going to reach many scientists with just one teacher. Um, and sustainable from a financial viewpoint as well would have been nice. So that's where the, the fourth iteration came in, started in January last year. And this time uh, they called these, these short two-day workshops uh, boot camps, software carpentry boot camps. And they were based on uh, a group called the Hacker Within, which is a a, a grassroots group of graduate students at the University of Wisconsin in the States, basically grad students teaching uh, uh, software carpentry or basic computing skills to other um, grad students. And so the audience for these boot camps was typically 40 or 50 people. Um, and importantly, they were graduate students, so they have a bit more time than undergraduates, which is nice. And they also have the motivation because they've got a project that they're actually working on, a problem that they're working on, and now they've suddenly realised that they really need to know this stuff. Um, and the usual teaching model is you normally have two lecturers over the two days kind of alternating and five kind of helpers roaming around helping people with uh, issues as they go. And this, this fourth iteration really, I guess, exploded in popularity. And over the period January 2012 to July this year, uh, there's been 92 boot camps worldwide and reached over 3,000 scientists. And there's a whole heap of like really uh, prestigious institutions in there, like you know Oxford, Harvard, Stanford, you name it. Uh, it's a it's a who's who's list of places where they've taught. And <clears throat> so what we did was that we got uh, Greg Wilson to come out. Uh, in February this year to Australia to host the first boot camps outside of uh, North America and the US, uh, sorry, North America and Europe. Um, and he, did a, he first did a boot camp uh, at the Genes to Geoscience Research Centre at Macquarie in Sydney, and then he came down to Melbourne and after the Australian Meteorological and Oceanographic Society conference that we had in February, uh, a lot of the uh, people at that conference stayed on for an extra two days, uh, 70 people in fact stayed on, uh, to do a boot camp uh, at the University of Melbourne, and that was the one I was organised uh, with some people from the uh, ARC Centre of Excellence for Climate System Science. And already we've got uh, Brisbane and Adelaide booked in for uh, boot camps with the bioinformatics community uh, in September this year in Brisbane and Adelaide. Uh, we're thinking of having another one down here in Hobart for the AMOS conference next year, and pretty certain there'll be boot camps uh, again, mostly for biology and bioinformatics people in Melbourne, Sydney and Canberra uh, before the end of this year. So that's software carpentry in a nutshell and how it came about, but what do we actually teach to scientists at these boot camps? And this is, I guess, what we think is the perfect outline for uh, a boot camp for weather slash climate scientists. So the content varies a little bit depending on the audience, but this is what uh, we think is best for that audience, and it doesn't vary that much between boot camp. 
And so I guess first up, there's like a, a pre-boot camp, I guess, um, warm up that people can do, um, watching some of the online videos that they developed back in 2010 on the Unix shell and things. And this is stuff as simple as we basically teach them 12 or so basic Unix commands um, with, the, I guess, the intention of just getting the concept across of, you know, using single purpose or joining single purpose functions using like filters and pipes and things like that and just getting the computer to repeat things for you um, using loops and, you know, history and things like that. And that, I mean, the weather and climate science community probably has a little bit of a higher base level of knowledge than most other communities, uh, like say the medical community and stuff like that. So um, not many people needed this warm up activity, but in some of those other boot camps, that just that simple Unix stuff um, comes out in the questionnaires as something people find really valuable. So that's, I guess, the really low level that we're talking about with a lot of graduates and it's really starting from, from scratch. Um, so day one at our weather and climate science uh, boot camp. The theme is programming like a programmer, basically. And we teach in Python because it's free, it's intuitive, um, and so we have to obviously give a bit of an intro to the syntax and all those types of things, but really the purpose of the first day is talking about program design and testing. So how to, you know, grow a program, I guess, incrementally as a series or a set of, you know, comprehensible, reusable functions. Um, so a lot of the stuff that the previous speaker was talking about, actually. Um, so that takes a lot of day one. And then day two, I guess the theme is keeping track of your stuff. So we introduce version control. Um, we teach kind of SVN or Git, um, depending on really the lecturer's preference. Um, there's a lot of debate amongst the tutors about which one we should be teaching, but I don't think it really matters. They both essentially do the same thing. Um, and then data management is, a, is another thing that a lot, of, uh, a lot of the questionnaires are picking up that people want a lot of help with. with they've got so much data and they just want help managing it. Now this is, this is a really good thing to teach in the weather and climate sciences because as a profession we've pretty much settled on a common file format. So we use NetCDF or Network Common Data Form and there's a whole climate and for forecasting metadata convention that goes with using those types of files in our area. So there's a lot of stuff we can teach but to a more general audience it's a little more tricky and besides telling people, you know, have a sensible directory structure and use sensible file names, um, it's a little bit difficult to know exactly what to teach and what you can teach to a generic audience. So that's, that's something that I guess Software Carpentry is trying to answer um, as we speak. And then that content typically doesn't take the entire two days. So we also fit in some <coughs> kind of self-contained uh, units that are most relevant to the audience that we've got. So you, we might look at NumPy if they're doing a lot of numerical stuff, regular expressions, databases, or even just have someone come in and give a demo of um, someone who has really good programming practices in that area of science that come in and just do a demo of how they use the principles of software carpentry in their daily work. So that's what we teach, but how do we teach it? Um, there's a big emphasis, and if anyone was in the room this morning for the Python 102 uh, session, um, really a lot like that in terms of all live coding. So we're not using slides basically at all. It's all just live coding because people seem to learn a lot more when you actually or they seem to learn a lot just from watching you uh, do it, basically. Um, and it's also kind of exciting because you're waiting for them to make a mistake and, and all those kind of things. Um, we have an emphasis, I guess, on free and open source tools because we want people to leave so that the participants come with their laptops. Um, hopefully everything's installed beforehand, otherwise we help them with that. And so everything's on their laptop ready to go so when they leave and go back to their lab, go back to their desk, they basically have no excuse but to just start using what we've been teaching because it's all set up and ready to go on their machine. Um, <clears throat> most of our teachers and helpers are either scientists themselves or they spend a lot of time working with scientists. So uh, that really helps. They have a, a very good idea of what scientists need to know and probably more importantly what they don't need to know uh, to get the job done. We use a, I don't know if anyone's seen Etherpad. Um, there's a bit of a screen capture of it here. It's basically a website um, where we use a fair bit for just like cutting and pasting sections of code, interesting bits and pieces, and then everyone has that up on their browser sitting there with their laptops and they can cut and paste into their script and all those kinds of things and they can, um, they can post comments and things. And so that's actually a really useful tool um, that we use. Sticky notes is another cool thing that uh, Greg Wilson really likes, where you can see this guy here, he's got a, a green post-it note on the lid of his laptop, which means things are going perfectly, he doesn't need any help. Uh, but as soon as he runs into trouble, you whack a pink 
or a red sticky note up on the lid of your laptop and one of the, one of the um, helpers comes around and helps you out just quietly on the side while the class goes on and that really just helps with, I guess, things going smoothly throughout the day. Um, there's a big emphasis on pair programming or working on lots of hands-on exercises in pairs because it's a little bit like, you know, code reviews and everything like that works so good when you've got other people looking at your code and stuff. So um, there's a lot of working in pairs. And there's also actually Software Carpentry offers a, a teacher training course. So it takes about 12 weeks and you have, you have to give about two to four hours of your time and it basically teaches would-be instructors a lot of basics of, you know, educational psychology and all these kind of teaching principles as they relate to teaching programming so that there's like a, a bit of a baseline of skill and knowledge when it comes to teaching and there's a, a bit of a quality control on the people who are, are teaching software carpentry boot camps. Okay, so that's, that's what we teach and uh, I mean 92 boot camps in, in 18 months is pretty impressive but it hasn't been without its challenges obviously um, and so these are probably the main four. Um, the first challenge is that is that I guess no matter how fast or how slowly you teach things, um, you always end up with about 20% of your audience that is kind of overwhelmed and it's too much for them. You get another 20%, it's just too easy, they're bored. Um, so what do you do? And um, Greg's tried a lot of like pre-boot camp questionnaires, um, but people seem to be notoriously bad at uh, self-assessing how good they are at these things. Um, another thing you could do, I guess, is a bit of a proficiency test for people before they come along with that has tended to scare people off a bit. Um, so the best thing they've found is having a cohort of people who have a similar background. So they're all weather and climate scientists, or they're all biologists, or they're all ecologists, or whatever they are. That, that tends to help a lot with having a fairly level um, playing field when it comes to the, the knowledge of the audience. Um, proving that we're helping is another difficult thing. Um, we're starting to do post boot camp questionnaires and things, but how do you quantify it, like the productivity of a program, or let alone the productivity of a scientist and whether you've improved that because of the course you gave them? So that's, that's a tricky thing that um, software carpentry is still grappling with. Um, software installation is still also a massive problem, and I mean, it's a problem for people who are really experienced in this stuff, so it's obviously a nightmare for beginners. Uh, in Melbourne, the, big, the great thing we had, because we had the conference the three days beforehand, people could come to our help desk during that conference and get assistance with their, their installation and stuff, but that continues to be a nightmare for most boot camps. Um, and related to that, <coughs> text editors, uh, funnily enough, seem to be a bit of an issue. So, I mean, we don't really want to be encouraging people to use naive editors like Notepad, but the kind of the legacy Unix editors like VI and Emacs are kind of... Uh, a nightmare when it comes to beginners. So that's, that's a problem as well. And I guess the last challenge has been follow-up. So um, we don't want to just leave these people cold when they finish the boot camp. Um, so what do we do to, give, to, to continue to help them out? And one of the things we've been doing, and why I've got the Etherpad um, screen capture up here, is they offer online office hours um, for, say, a two-hour two period every week where some of the tutors make themselves available online and the participants basically log into Etherpad um, type in their problem and then one of the tutors goes, yep, I know a bit, a bit about that area. And then the tutor will go off with that student and they'll open another private uh, Etherpad page or they'll do some kind of desktop sharing arrangement or something so they c that student can get some help uh, with their programming. And the people who have <coughs> participated in that have really loved it. I mean, it's, it's pretty rare that you get such one-on-one -on -one feedback. Um, but there hasn't been a lot of people logging in. I don't know whether they just don't think there is such a thing as a free lunch, which it is a free lunch in this case. Um, but that continues to be a challenge, is just getting people to, to actually log in um, to, for starters. So last bit of the talk is how you might be able to get involved. And I guess there's probably four ways. So you can obviously, if you're a scientist in the room, uh, you could participate in a boot camp. And on the, on the website, there's a list of all the upcoming boot camps around the world. Um, you can organise one for your institution or group. Um, that's what I did. I mean, I, I found the Software Carpentry Bootcamp, uh, Software Carpentry website really useful. So I just contacted the info, email address, and basically asked Greg if he wanted to come out to Australia, and he said yes. <laughs> so um, that's a really good thing, and they have a lot of support for you if you want to organise one yourself. Uh, teaching is also an option if you're someone who helps a lot of scientists and would like to see the level of their knowledge improved and obviously there's a teacher training course and all sorts of uh, support for teachers 
or you can just browse the teaching materials if you're interested. I mean, on the Software Carpentry GitHub page, all the teaching materials are available under a Creative Commons license, so um, it's a really wonderful resource. So in summary, uh, the low computational competency of graduate scientists is really causing them to struggle in today's research environment of big data and open science. Um, but Software Carpentry has been working on this problem for a while now and is here to help, so um, yeah, please get involved in any way you can. And I've got up here, just to finish, um, a paper up on archive that a group of the Software Carpentry tutors have written. Um, should be published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences fairly soon, but it basically summarises in a really nice paper um, what it is that they teach. Um, so if you're, particularly if you're a scientist, that's a really good paper to read. And my details are up there as well. I, I write a blog on research best practice in weather and climate science, and I, I tweet on the same topic. So there are my details there as well. Thanks. Questions? Yep. Oh, do we? Yeah, sorry. Uh, thanks for your talk. That looks like a really interesting program uh, set of set of materials. Uh, do you know if they have considered using the IPython notebook instead of the Etherpad? Because it seems like uh, setting up a notebook that everyone can that would be another good way that you could share snippets and uh, have live demos and that kind of thing. Yeah, they. Um, I mean, I know they want to and they really want to transition to that, but I think they've had install problems has been the major thing that's been holding them back. And um, as soon as they get those things sorted, I think they'll make the switch and they'll be using Notepad, yeah, straight away. But yeah, it's been plagued by install problems from what I've heard. So you're saying there was problems with the editors or deciding what sort of editors to use. Yeah. What do you end up doing? Uh, they end up, from what I can gather, they end up um, suggesting a range of open source or near open um, text editors to use. But it just it just seems to be that from the feedback they've been getting from all the teachers that they, they get there and just, just getting people using the text editor in the very first <laughs> exercise is like a real challenge even after they've made those suggestions. It's just one of those things that, um, yeah, I mean, I, they haven't settled on one that they think is best. There's just, they suggest a suite at the moment, yeah. Yeah, um, so one of the things that seems to me to be the case is that the science community has a pretty ingrained set of, you know, conferences and like an academic, you know, schedule for the year that they're engaged with. And there's not a big crossover with the, with uh, software conferences and software activities just in general. So it sometimes seems like a problem of never the two shall meet because you can't get accepted into the science conference because you don't have a paper because you come from an IT background and you're not presenting results. But the IT conferences are not of sufficient value to the scientist because of the time uh, input required and the limited content that's relevant to them. Is there mm. a way you can see forward there? Yeah, you're right. That is a, a tricky one. I mean, if, yeah, if you were a if you had a software background and you submitted an abstract, there wouldn't really be a session for you at most conferences. So, I mean, I, I'd suggest, to, I, I think, I mean, when I suggested to the, the Australian Meteorological and Oceanographic Society conference that we have Greg come and speak as a keynote at our conference um, and do the boot camp after, they were really supportive of it. Um, I, think, I think people realise that there's a problem and if you tell to a scientist that in 10 years' time you're going to have to, or even less, you're going to have to be giving your code to a journal, they tend to, like, panic. Um, and so there's a general feeling that they need to lift their game and they just don't know how. So I, I think if you were to suggest to conference organisers and just approach them and say, can we have a special session just on computing in this area of science, that they would go for it. And if you could, if you could pitch um, a really cool session, it would be really well supported, I think, yeah. Um, have you got any uh, acknowledgements in any papers that uh, your your group has um, sort of helped the the authors with the software behind it? That that might be some some way of looking at um, the I impact that you're having. Yeah, actually, that that's a good thought. I haven't. I mean, there isn't anything on the website that I know of. Of you're right. A lot of 
even Python packages and stuff, there's at least on their site, they say, if you use our stuff, acknowledge us, please. Yeah, there is, that's a good idea, actually. I might suggest that to them. Um, yeah, because that, that would be one way of proving that you're helping, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah that's a good suggestion. Um, debuggers, uh, do you address debuggers at all? Yeah, in the, you know, I guess the first day when we we're talking about programming like a programmer, we introduced using like PDB and kind of, you know, stepping through your code and stuff like that. And I mean, most, well, pretty much all the audience of scientists would never have seen something like that. They'd, they're all just, you know, editing the code, putting in a print statement and then running it and then changing where they put the print. And so that, that tends to be a, one, well, one of a hundred of things, like version control and all these things, a bit of a mind-blowing thing there where they're like, oh my God, there's such an easier way to do these things. So yeah, um, just the very basics with PDB we usually introduce. Unfortunately, afternoon tea is upon us, so if you have any more questions, I'm sure Damien will be around the conference. In the meantime, I'm sure you'll all join me in thanking Damien for his awesome talk. We have PyCon coffee from Ritual Coffee. It's a Norwegian blue. And a lovely PyCon coffee mug for you to drink the coffee out of. Thank you very much. Thank you.